This is Understanding Your Spirit Lesson 2. Last month we began looking at this very important subject and we noticed that it is a subject that is uh, not that popular and very little understood. The average Christian knows very little about the spirit and the soul. What is the spirit? What is the soul? And if you ask ministers, I remember asking my father when I was a teenager, well, Dad, what is the soul and what is the spirit? And and um, and and he was uh, fo- uh, foggy on on this, and and so were <clears throat> any number of the people I I talked to about it. I remember after I was baptized in the Spirit. Uh, my first pastor uh, in that dimension, Brother Joe Connor, he he talked a lot on spirit, soul, and body, and got my interest going there. But uh, it was many years before really understanding the soul and the functions of the soul, and then exploring uh, the functions of my spirit. You know, your spirit, my spirit. How is this different from the Holy Spirit? Uh, when the New Testament says heart, does it always mean spirit? Or does it sometimes mean the imagination, which is part of the mind, or even the reasoning power that we saw in the book of Proverbs? And we talked about that last month. One of the things I said in last month's teaching was we need to compare the tripartite nature of man based there in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, your whole spirit, and soul, and body, that it is actually comparable to the Old Testament tabernacle or temple. And we saw there were three main parts of the, of the temple, the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. And we saw that the body, soul, and spirit corresponds to the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And the purpose for that is for understanding that with your spirit, you connect with God. Your soul, your mind, your personality, you connect with and interact with people. And with your body, you connect with earth. And this is also seen in the lighting that was present in the Old Testament tabernacle. The outer court didn't have a roof. So the light of the outer court was the sun by day and the moon and stars by night. It was natural light. But when the priest would go into the holy place to serve in the tabernacle and later the temple throughout their courses, uh, their light was provided by the seven-branched golden candlestick. And it had to be kept burning day and night. It was uh, produced by olive oil flowing through this this seven branch golden candlestick structure that Moses had had built by Bezalel in the holy ab there in the old testament and then when you got into the holy of holies and the high priest saw this every year on Yom Kippur there was that shekinah a beautiful luminescent cloud right over the mercy seat between the two golden cherub that Shekinah that beautiful supernatural light that divine light that visible manifestation of the invisible God that was there 24-7 it's interesting when you look in the Old Testament history you see the outer court was defiled the sons of Hophni and Phinehas although it wasn't actually uh, the, the the outer court it served that same purpose there in the early part of 1 Samuel the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas there where the ark of God was enclosed in a tent at Shiloh they assembled with the women by troops and engaged in, in orgies actually and although as I've said it was not actually the, 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 the specific outer court it served the same purpose so we could see that the outer court or the body realm 
was defiled there in the Old Testament. And then we see in Ezekiel chapter 8, where the priest of Ezekiel's day, and Ezekiel had been training to become a priest. He was carried away captive into Babylon before he ever got to fulfill any priestly function. But we see that he uh, was permitted by God in a vision when he was there by the river Kibar in the land of Babylon to go in a vision and see that the holy place of the temple in Jerusalem that had by this time been destroyed but previously when God revealed to him what had happened and what had resulted in the destruction of that temple he saw all kinds of abominable beasts of every kind and graven images or idols uh, actually written on the inner walls of the holy place and in the same way we see that the mind of believers can have all kinds of graven images and idols and unclean things in the thought life the imaginations can be dark and we see this verified of course in New Testament scriptures but the Holy of Holies was never never polluted never defiled throughout all of the old covenant now God did abandon it we see that and when the temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel during the post exilic period when Israel was brought back when when Judah actually was brought back from Shinar the land of Babylon after 70 years of of being exiled away from the Holy Land and they came back and they rebuilt the uh, temple that there was no Shekinah no glory that came as had come when Solomon had first built the temple and we're told there in Second Chronicles 7 how the the Kabod Yahweh the glory of the Lord had, had filled uh, the entire temple structure and then it abode permanently in the Holy of Holies from that time until God departed from the temple that uh, Ezekiel 9 gives a picture of when that happened and only after that happened could judgment come on the temple and it could be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and his armies well anyway there we have a beautiful picture of spirit, soul and body and you connect and interact with God in your spirit you connect and interact with people through your personality your suke the Greek word for soul is suke it's p-s-u-c-h-e is the transliteration into English and it's where our word psych uh, as in psychiatry psychology and psyche uh, the, the personality the mental structures how the mind functions that's all part of the soul very easy to see there in the Greek and in Paul's writing and here also in the picture of the temple and that's how you communicate with people is is through the soul area this is where your likes and dislikes are your preferences your cultural viewpoint your psychological makeup these are all part of the soul all of your attitudes are, are there in your soul and when Paul talks about the spirit of your mind being renewed that one place in Ephesians 4 I think he is speaking there of uh, the attitude of the mind well, one of the times when he used pneuma not to mean the believers pneuma but the attitude of the mind and so we we see that in the Word of God very very clearly but looking here in the spirit the spirit is the part of you where God in you where it all comes together this is where God in you function this is the deepest part of your being this is uh, your beingness the sense where you, of you that you sense most deeply uh, for most of us it's when we're in deep worship or deep prayer when we spend considerable amount of time in prayer or worship or both uh, alone or private and we suddenly sense that deep deep part of us that that is your spirit you're actually sensing your spirit the ability to see God uh, is actually a function of your spirit 
and and later as you as your spirit becomes more preeminent or dominant in your Christian life and and you begin to actually allow God to govern you out of your spirit through your soul in your body at this point uh, you begin to see God you can see God in events and circumstances and situations with other people you can see God in nature this is where what Jesus said in Matthew 5 is fulfilled blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God meaning the the ability to discern and perceive God in daily life I think is what he is referring to there uh, not just an absolute sense of seeing God his servant shall serve him and they shall see his face there in Revelation at the end when everything is wrapped up but right now being able to see God in various circumstances and situations of life uh, this is where love now love fills the soul and love is manifested through the body but it originates in your spirit and this is how you emanate the very nature of God out of your spirit through your demeanor into your behavior this is coming out of your spirit and this is the part of you where God has put his seed in you First John 3 9 says that that not only are we born of God or begotten of God but that he has put his seed in us and his seed remains in us that is his very nature just like that word seed sperma is the Greek word it's used for the reproductive seed in plants animals and humans in the Greek language all of the biological makeup of a corn is in the seed of the corn that's why when it's planted it produces the corn God said it early part of Genesis every seed shall bring forth fruit of its own kind you plant wheat seed you get wheat you plant apple seed you get the apples and so on and so forth uh, man reproduces the son in his image we're told that over and over in the genealogical chapters of the Bible he begat a son in his own likeness in the same way the likeness and image of God is in your spirit the DNA of God is in your spirit this is the part of you where it all comes together this is the deepest part of you and this is the part of you where God wants you to connect with him, fellowship with him, where he wants to give forth revelation, illumination within you, and then project it onto the screen of the mind. So it comes out of your spirit onto the screen of the mind, just like the gift of the word of knowledge, visions, understandings by the spirit. It's how the spirit works in connection with the soul and to bring forth a full manifestation in the body because see you are one whole the whole of you is not just your spirit not just your soul not just your body the whole of you is spirit soul and body the body of course is the earthen vessel the earthen vessel houses both soul and spirit from birth to death it keeps you housed on earth in most scriptures the word for body is actually neutral that means it is neither good nor evil but when we see the word flesh in the New Testament sometimes the word flesh means the sin principle that that believers struggle with where the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these two are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would in Galatians chapter 5 but in other places as when Jesus said the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak he was referring to the physical frame and its functions and how that his disciples were not being evil but not joining him in fervent prayer in the garden of Gethsemane but were instead simply being overcome by the weakness of the flesh meaning the physical body was exhausted 
they had been spent emotionally throughout that last supper period it was it had been a hard day they were tired and they were sleeping and uh, the flesh was weak uh, <clears throat> so often your your body is neutral and the flesh I what how I see it is it's the sin principle the sin principle that can be present in your members on the earth as Paul said in Romans 6 meaning your physical members but how that it can also be reckoned crucified with Christ and then it is overcome and the body becomes the ally of the spirit now the mind usually seeks the body as its ally and the body and the mind usually work together uh, in close tandem and this is where we have so many problems as people wanting to manifest God in the earth desiring to to live truly in the spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh is when the unrenewed mind and the body begin working together in tandem and problems arise there uh, we begin having struggles uh, we begin fighting as it were an inward fight or struggle and that's one of the things that we hope to this year as we continue studying understanding your spirit that we help you to see important keys and principles how you can live more out of your spirit all right we now want to look in some detail at various scriptures to get a better understanding here of the spirit part of us Hebrews 12 and verse 9 the father of spirits furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh or of our bodies which corrected us and we gave them reverence so we've had human parents and we subjected ourselves to them when we were young shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live so the writer to the Hebrews refers to God as the father of spirits God fathered our our spirits your spirit was fathered of God John says it also first John five eighteen. we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not so John says there is part of you that is born of God and does not sin this is something so hard for many Christians to understand and if you have been grappling with this please hear me out and, and then take it to the Lord wait on him for clarity friend there is part of you that is holy holy of holies there is part of you that has God's nature now James says God cannot sin James also says God cannot be tempted with evil there's part of you that is never tempted part of you that has never been tempted uh, part of you is tempted that is the body is tempted the mind is tempted the body is tempted with physical sin the mind is tempted uh, often working in tandem with the body uh, to f committing physical sin the desire comes in the mind and that flesh principle gets to work there and you see that's like what Paul said in Romans 7 for in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing so he said he said there's something in my flesh and in that flesh dwells nothing good there, there's nothing good in my flesh but then John says hey there's nothing evil in your spirit and that part of you that's born of God there's something holy and that part of you that that is of the earth and earthy uh, there is nothing that is that is intrinsically holy now by this we don't mean that the body's condemned to sinning I'm not saying that please don't let the mind run ahead 
in these teachings. We, we are delineating these teachings on understanding your spirit. And if you r- let the mind run ahead, and that's been a problem your whole Christian life, is letting your mind jump to concussions. <laughs> and jumping to concussions always produces headaches. <laughs> If you let the mind run ahead, you're going to end up with a royal bangaroo headache. And people are always, they they just got to keep their mind going, going, going. Let your mind hear this. It goes into your mind, of course. But then let it settle down upon you. And as you let it settle down upon you, uh, let the calmness come, let the sweetness come, and then let the revelation come. Remember, revelation or light is sown like seed for the righteous. What does that mean? It comes as a little seed truth in you, and, and then it springs forth. It doesn't take weeks or months for it to spring forth. It could spring forth in seconds or minutes. Time is irrelevant here. But what you must do is you must be still just like the soil is still when a seed is put into it or that soil is continually moved around that seed can never take root and can never produce a plant and then produce fruit through the plant in the same way with you and me when we are hearing a revelational truth we have to be still inside us part of us has to be still or we won't see it the mind will get involved or the imagination will really get involved running way ahead of what the spirit is actually saying and end up going off in a t- on a tangent all right but the part of you that is born of god is your spirit jesus said it in john chapter 3 recorded by saint john the gospel of john chapter 3 that which is born of the spirit is spirit that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born out of a physical body is a physical body and that which is born out of the spirit is a spirit that's what the greek interlinear uh, that's how it translates it right out of the greek text of the new testament so what he is saying here is that in your spirit Uh, That is where you are born of God. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Uh, As a boy, I used to hear it preached. You you have to let your soul be born again. And all the souls that are born again will go to heaven. Actually, the soul is not born again. The Spirit is born again. And when it comes to what we call salvation or rescue, uh, the Greek word soter, to save, or soteria salvation all of those various renderings of the soter verb uh, what it has to do with is salvation and in tenses in the past tense your spirit was saved in the present tense your soul is being saved and in the future tense your body will yet be saved that that is one way of looking at it of course 1 John 3, 9 Whoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed, his sperma remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God cannot sin part of you cannot sin and and please make the decision again if your mind is revolting against this or your past religious indoctrination is rising up against this if God shows it to me if it's there in the scripture and the Holy Spirit makes it real to me so that my spiritual eyes can see the reality of what is being spoken I choose to receive the word that I am hearing today I choose to receive it you know that decision really cost me as a teenage Christian I was I was hungry I was so desirous for something more from God and as I read the New Testament especially the book of Acts I read about the baptism in the Holy Spirit the baptism with the Holy Spirit the gift of the Holy Ghost I read and and saw those verses and 
and something in me yearned for that reality. Well, that experience was anathema in my Christian background. And not only was it considered only for the weak and psychiatric unstable Christians who needed a crutch to lean on, but it was even viewed as demonic. Uh, and the manifestation of that experience of tongues was even called the tongues devil. And I had all of those years of, of brainwashing, and yet in my heart I knew I had not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I had not received that dunamis, that power, that Jesus promised there in Acts 1.8. And so I had to make a decision. Will I accept what I am shown, even if it goes against my upbringing, what all of my family believes, what my church, my beloved church, and, and like Christians back then, we were so indoctrinated. I'm a Christian first, and a Nazarene second, or a Baptist second, or a Methodist second, or a Lutheran second. We really felt that our particular brand of Christianity was the right one, and everyone else, well, theirs was definitely inferior, and some of them weren't even genuine. Some of them were counterfeit. Some of those people wouldn't even make it to heaven. That was all of the viewpoint that I had to deal with. But the hunger was so great. And the clarity of the word was so pure. I finally saw this, and it took about a month, six weeks of wrestling with this. And during this time, my spirit had no rest. Now, there are times when, when your mind or your emotions are grieved or troubled, but there are other times when your spirit is not at rest. Even though your spirit is born of God and has the nature of God, your spirit can be uh, at a place of not being at rest when the Holy Spirit is revealing to your spirit things that God has for you that you may be slow to accept. But that spirit, that deepest part of you, is always in agreement with the truth. Now, the mind may not be in agreement. The mind may wrestle and argue. The emotions may get flustered. <laughs> Have you ever been sort of miserable? when God was dealing with you about something. And I don't just mean something wrong that you've done, but I mean something good. He's trying to show you that you're maybe a, just a little slow to come on into. Well, that's, that's what I had to do. So I ask you to make that decision now. Although you've made it in the past, I'm sure. But reiterate this decision that whatever God clearly shows me in his word, I choose to believe it. I choose to receive it. If my mind cannot understand it, that's okay. I choose, to, I choose still to say, Lord, I receive it in my heart, in the core of my affections. I, I choose to, to believe this in my heart spirit part of me and receive it in my affections part of me that I will love this truth. And then it's amazing how things can very quickly come into focus and into being in your life. Praise God. Now, here is the part that I've been hesitating or leading up to for the last two or three minutes. You, if you see this in the Word, that God fathered your spirit, begat your spirit, that His seed remains in you, in that part of you. Oh, here it is. Part of you is divine. Part of you is human. Now, it's a struggle for a lot of Christians to do more than accept that the Holy Spirit is in them. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says the Holy Spirit is in you. And they read that and, okay, I believe it. Holy Spirit is in me. And then they can accept that Jesus is in them too. Jesus Christ is in you. Second Corinthians thirteen five. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. First John 4. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1. Okay, Jesus is in me and the Holy Spirit is in me. 
And then when the scripture says, like in 1 John 2, 23, that whoever confesses the Son, the same has the Father also. Is it possible that God the Father is in me? Well, Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. God the Father is in you. God the Father is in me? Yes. Well, God the Father is on his throne in heaven. Yes. God the Father is also omnipresent. He is everywhere, right? So why should it be so hard to accept he is in you? (laughs) Aren't you part of everywhere? (laughs) Oh, that sounds blasphemous. See, religion hated this. This is what got Jesus crucified. He said, the Father dwells in me. And they said to him, for good work we don't don't seek to destroy you, but because you blaspheme, you, you make yourself one with God. For that we want to kill you. Well, friend, to, to most Christians, the fact that we are one with God is only a mental, uh, a mental concept. Okay, I understand that because I'm justified by faith, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we accept it in the mind. It, it's just a mental concept. But it's actually more than a mental concept. It's actually deeper than the mind. It's part of your spirit. Part of your spirit being, you see, God in you. And this is really, I know, I know, but it's true. Now this is not saying that God is not apart from you or distinct from you or high and exalted. No, 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 no. But being God, he can do a number of things that we can't. That we can't in our minds, I should say, or in our bodies, I should say. Because in our spirit, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, He who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. Wow. The mind may grapple with this reality of both the human and divine. But deep inside in your spirit, you know this is true. Something says, yes, amen. I know that is so. What I am hearing is true. Praise God. You see, the Old Testament prophesied that that God would tabernacle in his people, that he would live in them and walk in them, and he would be their God. And they would be his people. Peter says these are exceeding great and precious promises. And and by these or through these, we see that we have been made partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4. In one way, 2 Peter 1.4 is lessened in many people's thinking is, is that it's through what they read in the pages of the Bible that makes them a partaker of the divine nature. But actually, that isn't so. It's what you read in the Bible that reveals to you what is in you. And that's why that deep reverberation is going on. That that what you're reading in the Bible is revealing to you as you have eyes to see and ears to hear. What God has already done in you. So it's confirming. It's confirming it. These exceeding great and precious promises of the Old Testament, I will take out of them the heart of stone and put within them a new heart responding to me. Yes, this is true. This was done by God in us. You say, well, this is just blasphemous. I can't accept it. Well, if it's there in the word, you said you would accept it. About 10 minutes ago, you promised that if God showed it to you in the word, no matter how much your mind grappled with it, you would accept it. So here you have the chance to either go right back into the wilderness of doubt and disbelief and wander around in circles, or enter into the land of rest, the promise of your inheritance, with a good heart and full assurance of faith, and say, yes, thank God, I am a partaker 
of the divine nature I am not only human I am also divine this is not blasphemous this is factual this is scriptural praise God if it was done by God then it is not blasphemy and and Paul was always ever trying to get people to see this in the course of his ministry and he referred to it as the mystery there in Ephesians 3 and verse 9 the mystery of Christ he says this mystery was hidden from past ages and generations but is now made known unto the saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of his inheritance his glory in us praise God this is the mystery and a mystery is a divine secret that is being revealed it, in fact, the word revelation does not bring, mean bringing forth in, into being something that was not there, but rather bringing into view something that was hidden. It was there, but it was hidden. It's like if you cover something over with a cloth, you can't see it. It is already there, but you can't see it until the cloth is removed. And the word revelation in the Greek word, in the Greek New Testament, means unveiling, taking away that which covers so that that which is hidden can be seen taking away that which covers so that that which is hidden may be seen praise God praise God praise God so just allow this beautiful truth this wonderful reality to, to sink in you say well how do I do it you, you don't do it God did it well, how do I make it real? You don't make it real. You receive it because it is real. And I believe that there's going to be someone hearing this CD or MP3, this message on the internet or right here in their home or in their car on the CD who is going to hear something that is just going to say yes inside. I'd like to know if if that went off in you listening to this if you'd let me know I'd like to know that that something is becoming real to you that maybe had never been as real to you as it is now and just enjoy this you see it is it is nothing you did it is what God did it is what God did praise God and there are so many other scriptures that we could go into right now but right for this moment, just pause and meditate and receive this reality. Not only is Christ in me, but this nature that he has given me, this divine nature, is in me. This divine nature is part of me. Part of me is divine. Part of me is human. I'm no longer a mere mortal. Not only... I, have I been born of man I've been born of God not only am I human I am also divine yeah don't get upset over it get blessed over it go ahead and accept it Th this is a trophy of grace this is a trophy of grace it is nothing you could have done it's what God did for you it is nothing you could have earned it's what Christ earned for you Praise God. And, and as you receive this by revelation, you begin to dwell more in your spirit than in your mind. Up until this point, you may have been one of the multitudes, vast multitudes of Christians who continually live more in the head, <coughs> more in the mind than they do in the spirit. Now here's another scripture we'd like to meditate upon. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Ephesians 5 and verse 30. I've meditated for hours and upon hours letting this scripture revolve around and around and around within me. 
and come to see it a little bit deeper, a little bit differently than before. We know that God is spirit. Jesus said God is a spirit, or in the Greek perhaps God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So as a spirit, or a spirit being, God has no flesh and bones. Paul said flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, so God is spirit. But when he tabernacles within humans, it can be said then, that we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones but in an even deeper way we could look at that metaphorically that Paul was saying that flesh and bones is substance our mind can touch our arm we can feel the matter and we can say there is substance there and we can look at flesh and bones as a metaphor of substance for we are members of his body of his substance in other words God is spirit there is no substance in spirit and yet it is so real for all substance came out of spirit before there was any matter before there was any material creation there was spirit and out of spirit was birthed all that we see throughout all of the heavens, the celestial bodies, the 100 billion galaxies, many of them with 100 or more, 100 billion or more stars, and each star with planets, or many stars with planets, so that we could say that that's a lot of matter <laughs> the understatement of the year right but all of that came out of the invisible all of that came out of the invisible but as you begin to sense God you begin to sense substance weightiness depth there becomes a sense of matter within you that is not of you, meaning of the little person with its little problems, its little tri tri troubles and struggles on earth, your little story of all that you've gone through in your life. But now that you come to the understanding that my spirit is fused, somehow fused with God, so that God's nature, the divine nature, is part of me part of what makes me me wow that when he said that he would literally tabernacle among us dwell in us you know ancient Israel they understood that the temple was the house of God that's where God lives that's his address on the earth and Jesus was the first human being who said destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it. Speaking of the temple of his body, John said in his gospel. Just think that you and I, we have been made partakers of the divine nature as the exceeding great and precious promises of the Old Testament scriptures foretold. And this is a reality partakers, associates, companions, sharers in the divine nature. N no, you and I are not the absolute. Yet God has put his very substance in us and fused it to us and made us part divine and part human. I mean, well, we're fully human, but then there's also the divine within us words are are difficult to use <clears throat> because uh, all of the words that were created in all of the languages were 
created and invented before we knew and understood this reality. And so we're trying to use words that have come about through the mind, through thoughts, to speak of that which is beyond thought and that which is beyond the mind, that which is beyond the body, that which is beyond our mere humanness. Now, way back, <clears throat> centuries back, Christians saw this before the Reformation, before there was a Protestant movement, before there were Protestant churches. There was the one church, the Roman Catholic Church. And yet within that structure, there were devout people, earnest worshipers of God, seeking after God, people that weren't enamored with the hierarchy of the church and the indulgences of the church. They were in love with God and wanted to know God like Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi, Meister Eckhart in Germany. Long before Martin Luther was born, he said there is something in you that cannot be said to be part of this world. Something in you that cannot be said to be part of this world. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? There is something in you that cannot be said to be part of this world. Martin Luther, the Reformation, posted his 95 Thesis on the wall at Wurmberg and on the door there. And uh, uh, the than Wittenberg and all of the great Protestant battles that were fought and and then among themselves those that aligned themselves with the Reformation movement and then came out of the Roman Catholic Church and formed their own Protestant churches uh, John Calvin Jacobus Arminius they formed their own schools of theology the Arminian school and the Calvin school Calvinistic doctrine uh, Armenian doctrine and and they all struggled this was one part where they struggled with too because they were very learned in scriptures and and they knew all these verses that we've been looking at today but they pondered this they mar they wondered about it you know Martin Luther said there's just no way that uh, man is, is is flesh there's no way that God can put himself in man it wouldn't be fitting. And Calvin said, well, but, 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 but through the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, we are made holy. And so God decrees us as fitting. And, and Arminians said, well, we are fitting so long as we are persevering to a certain degree of holiness in our life. And then if not, then it's gone. And all of them uh, debated for, for a couple of centuries over this very thing. Uh, but I remember as a boy, we, we never, we never heard that in our church that part of us is divine, part of us is human. And when these scriptures were were questioned or brought forth by students of the word, it was said, "Now be be, care, be real careful, be really careful. You're you're coming up to a very dangerous line here." But could it be? I just like to ask you this for a moment. <clears throat> Could it be that this is so important to God that he continued to bring this up generation after generation and century after century with a desire that there would be a generation that would come to embrace the very thing that he said that they are? And then there are others that say, now brother, just looking at this from a psychological point of view, if you, if you say that God is in you, uh, then you uh, and you could be said that you are saying I am God, and of course we have to understand and put you know brackets around that phrase as if we were ever to say that to to make it clear that we were not saying that we were the Godhead or the Absolute or uh, <clears throat> that which is exalted above the heaven and earth, but saying that God's substance was in us, like I have tried to say today. And, and just accepting that will change your life. But some have said, well, you know, the only people that say this are people that have been locked away. But 
all of those people who've been locked away are people who say only I am divine or I have divinity in me or like the old Pentecostal preacher Father Divine in New York City near the turn of the century the last century he said I am God and everyone started shouting I am God and they they got in this big revelation that they were God and uh, and so on but anyone who ever said that who is mentally challenged or psychologically disturbed is someone who only said I am God you're not whereas the New Testament has said we all are sharers of the divine nature there's nothing any more special in you or in me than in anyone else so that that everyone who has been born of God has this God in seed form as it were and this the seed of God that has been planted in us remember God said every seed shall bring forth fruit of his own kind and once again before the before the reformation Meister Eckhart said if you plant nut seeds you grow nut trees if you plant apple seeds you grow apple trees God has planted his seed to grow God in the earth Mm. to grow God in the earth well meditate upon that would you it is so precious coming to this as a deep understanding in your spirit understanding this part of you no you're not entirely God there's part of you that's just plain old David or Jack or Becky or Susan or whoever you are whoever any of us are Uh, but to say that part of us you see part of us or Paul put it this way in his letter to the Corinthians there in 2 Corinthians 4 he said but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us and he said indeed many times we are distressed and we are despairing and and we are in uh, problems of various kinds you see but <clears throat> when you understand and you can receive this blessed truth and it becomes part of you beyond the realm of theory now it has to go beyond the mental dimension it has to go beyond what your mind thinks but when it cuts down deep in your spirit and your spirit can see this and say this and affirm this and then you begin to live and move and have your being in God yeah and Paul said you get to the place where you actually look out and say and all things are of God Uh, you have to progress to a distance to be able to look out and say and all things are of God but when you get to that place within you where you can look out and say and all things are of God you begin to understand that nothing happens by chance or happenstance or by mere fortune or misfortune nothing happens to you based on luck no everything that happens within your life is orchestrated by an unseen hand and that hand is also in you and part of you is that hand and then you begin to become what is known as spiritual and our in our next lesson we will look at the question what does it mean to be spiritual in the Greek New Testament Paul gives this of people he would say but if any man thinks he is spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that I am writing are from God or he would refer to the spirituals the spirituals plural as people who functioned out of the pneuma and we'll look at the Greek words and, and all of this Uh, probably in our next lesson so that you can see that you too are a spiritual that you too are someone who functions out of your spirit 
Now, here is a state with most Christians. Most Christians are people, if you ask them, have you been born of the Spirit? Yes. Yes, I've been born of the Spirit. That means you have been born of God. Yes, I've been born of God. But the Spirit part of them is dormant. The Spirit part of them is dormant. The Spirit is alive. It's not dead in sin. The Spirit is filled with God's nature there's no evil there no sin there in that part of them but that spirit part of them is dormant or we could say asleep and this is why one of Jesus emphasis was on watchfulness wakefulness he wake up in the parable of the ten virgins while the bridegroom <clears throat> tarried they all slumbered and slept Paul to the Corinthians, awake to righteousness. Paul to the Romans, it is high time to awake out of sleep. Paul to the Ephesians, wake, O sleeper, and Christ will give you light. So, this is an emphasis in the New Testament because there are people who have a slumbering spirit. Their spirit is dormant or asleep and needs to be awakened. <clears throat> And this awakening is what God is doing today. He, he is awakening his people, waking us up, allowing us to come awake, and wanting us to be able to function in the spirit similar to the way we do in the body. Your spirit has eyes, and he wants those eyes to see. Your spirit has ears, and he wants that those ears to hear. Your spirit has a mouth that can speak. You can actually speak out of your spirit without even using your mouth. And you can taste. You can taste and see that the Lord is good. Where? In your spirit. Yeah. This is... <clears throat> <clears throat> This is vital. This is powerful. This is transformational. This will lift you up out of whatever kind of situation you are in and put you in a much better place. Now, why isn't this important to us? Well, because most of us are mind-based. And to the mind, this isn't ma this isn't important. Only what the physical eyes can see, smell, taste is important to the mind. Only how the physical man can prosper in the earth is important to the mind. Things of your spirit aren't even noteworthy to your mind. It's not even relevant or important. I remember in the early 70s sitting in Catherine Kuhlman meetings. There was something I sensed that was so alive and so precious and so real of the Holy Spirit's moving in those meetings. And my spirit was, was joining up to, rising up to join in that flow as were thousands of other people who were gathered there. And there were certain sensations, spiritual sensations or Feelings, you could say feelings. Most most feeling is in the soul, but this was deeper than the soul. It was, it was, it was deeper in the spirit realm that you could you could discern between good and evil, because your spiritual senses were activated or being exercised to discern between good and evil, and you could just discern what God was doing in that moment. And oh, it was incredible. And then as years went by. Uh, occasionally, there there were glimpses and movements of this, uh, even in my meetings, and God would move and the Holy Spirit would touch people, and it would be precious and powerful sometimes, but still on a much smaller scale and to a much lesser intensity than what had gone on in the Kuhlman meetings. But then in the early 90s, uh, everyone was talking about Toronto and the Toronto blessing, the Father's blessing, and things that were going on there. And I went up there several times. And one time when I was there and just sitting, and now uh, this was 
probably about 20 years since the Kuhlman meetings. But I was just sitting there and closed my eyes and suddenly it was as though I, I was in the Kuhlman meeting and the same nuances of the Spirit, the same sensations of the Spirit, the same uh, movements of the Spirit that I had felt 20 years before. It's like there had been no time and it was going on right now. They're sitting in a Toronto meeting. And really the Spirit is timeless. The, 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 the way time operates on the body and functions in psychological, the mind, uh, has no bearing at all in the Spirit. The Spirit is the timeless dimension. Uh, eternal doesn't mean unending time, okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean a long, 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 long time that never ends. Uh, eternal, timeless, has nothing to do with time. It is a state of being apart from time, different from time. Uh, time has no sense there. Oh, and, and then after you come out of that wonderful spirit dimension and you're, you're back operating in the mind and in the body, uh, the mind is so re refreshed, rested. And the body is, is invigorated and relaxed with a beautiful, there's an alertness, but it's a vibrant, alert rest. It's vibrantly alert. Oh, it's so wonderful. And, and my desire through these CDs, these studies, on understanding your spirit is that I will begin hearing from you that, yeah, I, I'm at least seeing what you're saying, David. I see it in the scriptures and I see it in, in your words that you are bringing forth. I can see the reality of what you are saying and it is gelling inside of me. It is going on here in the in this deeper place in me. Wow. Yeah, this is quickening me. It is quickening me to, to, to this deeper dimension, this deeper part. Wouldn't you much rather live out of your spirit than out of your mind? It is, it is so much better. Uh, and then the mind functions, but it doesn't govern. It doesn't dominate. It doesn't rule the roost. It doesn't determine everything that you feel most people live out of their minds and this is how their feelings rule them because thoughts determine feelings and whatever you think about is what you end up feeling people that are depressed have always been thinking negative thoughts prior to ever feeling of depression there was negative thinking people who are sad we're thinking the thoughts based on some surface life experience and there's a place for that but with some of us it goes on way too long uh, Paul said we desire that you don't mourn as those who have no hope and some people they keep mourning and mourning and living in a sad state friend uh, you're, you're, when you live and walk out of the mind Paul said you're actually living and walking as a mere man. And he chided the church of Corinth for doing that. He said you, you live like mere mortals. It's as though you don't know. <laughs> Not only who you are in Christ, he didn't actually say that phrase that way, but I understand that phrase and agree with the truth of it, of course. But he was saying you don't know what you are. You don't know what is in you. You don't know what God has done in you. And that's why he went on to teach on the, about the treasure in the earthen vessel. Because they just didn't get it. Hey, I, I know very few Christians that have gotten this. <laughs> I know very few that have grasped this. But when you begin to get it, when you begin to grasp it, you, your life begins to change. That maybe nothing in the outer changes, but the very, very essence of your life changes. That which gives you the zeal and the zest for life intensifies. That which gives you the hunger and the thirst after righteousness 
is increasingly satisfied and uh, there beco- there comes a richness it's, it's just a richness of of oh it's just wonderful I I, uh, I can tell you it's wonderful now some have said well where is my spirit and they'll point to their belly or their chest and actually your spirit even though yes Jesus did compare the spirit of the believer to the the large belly of the rock out of out of which side the rivers of water flowed there in the wilderness for the children of Israel as recorded in Psalm 78 and Psalm 105 actually your spirit is not in your belly your spirit has no physical location the spirit has no physical location and even though we think of body soul and spirit and and like in the temple or tabernacle <clears throat> the biggest part was the outer court and then the inner court was made up of the holy place and holy of holies but in the uh, reality of spirit soul and body even though the smallest place of the temple was the holy of holies that was only 10 cubits by 10 cubits in the tabernacle very small 10 cubits about 18 inches so it's very small area small cube 10 10 cubits squared actually in uh, the that was just a shadow you see foreshadowing the biggest part of you is your spirit (laughs) the biggest part of you is your spirit it's not located there in your tummy or in your intestines or in bowels of mercies physically speaking that was just a, a metaphor once again a pointer Paul was using a pointer to try to describe it. It's not something the mind should take literally and say, that is it, that's the way it is. But your spirit is outside of you and inside of you. Uh, you can sense a person's spirit before you ever sense or hear them physically approach you. You can sense their spirit. And not just godly people, but people that aren't, aren't uh, even spiritual in any shape, fashion, or form, no experience or pursuit after God in their life. When you become awakened enough in your own spirit, you can begin to sense this. Or maybe as a grown adult, you've gone home to visit your parents. And as you enter the home, even if it's a home you weren't raised in, you can still sense, oh, that's mother, or that's dad. And you're sensing their spirit. See? Part part of a person's spirit is that individual essence of their per- personhood. Okay? So your your spirit is not just God, but your spirit is also the essence of you. <sighs> you know, I really thank God. I feel like this is coming out a lot better than uh, what I had thought it would... Uh, a few days ago as I was working on this and the first attempts at recording on it uh, were, were uh, <laughs> they were a bit discouraging but I sense today uh, as I've been speaking that some of what I am saying is coming forth and I hope you'll let me know let me know that it spoke to you and touched you and yeah even if you can't quite emulate it into or put it into words yourself, you can say, "Brother, I just by when I was hearing your voice, something was going off inside me. Something was was happening in me that I was saying, "Yeah, yeah, that's right." And I'll be so glad to know that. Praise God. Well, enough has come forth now to dwell upon, meditate upon. And I pray that you will find some still place to sit with this and to allow that uh, deeper part of you to begin to resonate with the seeds that have been sown that will produce light in you over the next days and weeks. As you become still, maybe during your quiet time, prayer time, devotional time, or even during the day while you're at work and there 
comes a, a lapse of activity, a pause, you're able to turn yourself Godward and meditate and just sense, just sensing the Lord with your spirit, sensing the depths of God inside you. As you begin doing this and practicing this, the reality of the divine nature in you will grow stronger and stronger. And I do once again ask you to let me know. And I want to say thank you. There have been 21 or 22 of you, or maybe a few more than that, who have corresponded with me for the first time in months and months lately and have g made a gift, an offering, a sacrifice to the work that we are doing. I just received a, another book translated into Urdu published in Pakistan in the mail here for me to look at. Beautiful job, beautiful job and through the internet and of course through the hundreds of thousands of books that have been published over the last three decades in all these different like more than 30 languages we are touching lives in different parts of the globe and when you give you're helping me catch up it's been two years now since I was traveling full time and then physical trials in the body have come but thank God none of it could disturb what God had done inside me and no matter what trials you may go through when you have this deeper part of you vibrantly alive nothing can put out your little light <laughs> this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine and if in your spirit you sense I'm to send David something to help him over the next few days or week or two it would be such a help such a blessing to me and I've watched quite a bit of Christian television the last two years here in my home I hadn't watched hardly any Christian TV for decades until the last two years. And although, it, yes, there, there's a valid part of it that is helping people, it is so, so much more shallow than where God wants us to be. Now, thank God that there are multitudes out of there for whom it is deep. But I'm saying to you that you're not going to hear things like what you hear coming forth through this branch of the vine <laughs> you're not going to be finding it all over the vine no you just won't be so there is a, a need for the word that God has given to this one there is a need for sure word ministries to flourish there is a need uh, for messages and and what I'm doing now is taking tapes and transferring them into mp3 I recently purchased a machine that will help me do that much more quickly and I won't have to sit on top of and actually monitor every minute so that I can do a lot of it automatically and very soon at davidalsobrook.com at the free online resources section of the website there will be a lot of the messages that came forth 20 and 30 years ago uh, there'll be even more we have like 150 on there right now of messages the Lord has been giving me the last seven or eight years plus some that he'd given the years before a total of about 150 but they're going to be probably that many more again so that and I get emails from Africa and Indonesia, Philippines, New Zealand, uh, other parts of the world where people are downloading these free of charge and listening to them. Uh, e even a brother in China was telling me he, he's, an, he's an Englishman that 
is doing the work of the Lord in China. He said it has been such a blessing for him to download these teachings and listen to them. He doesn't have much spiritual food there, and it is a real blessing. Now, my mailing address is Sure Word Ministries, P.O. Box 2305, 2305, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37024. Or uh, you can contact me through email d alsobrook at gmail dot com or david alsobrook dot com for the website or if you want to phone for prayer or if you're going through a real troubling time i do uh, freely counsel people who call six one five three six six five eight 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 as the lord allows me to to do so i'm very happy to do so so do contact me, connect with me. God bless you. I love you. Thanks so much for your time, for listening, and for considering the things you've heard.